Come explore our world of coffee. Deluna Coffee was founded in 2014 by Ed and Courtney Lemmicks alongside their son, Brett. The Lemmickses are Pensacola natives with a passion for coffee, so what better than their Beechin blend, which is just that, Beechin. It's their classic combination of Colombian and Brazilian beans. It creates a superior French roasted coffee taste, lower in caffeine, so it'll keep you easy breezy. Ed and Brett are both FSU alums and are extending a special offer to our listeners. Use the promo code WORDCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit thelunacoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Wake up. WarChant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closers only. Now here's WarChant.com's Aslan Hunchavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! What's up, everybody? It's Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee, DeLunaCoffee.com. Come explore our world of coffee. Head over to that website. Use that promo code WarChant15 for a 15% discount off all the delicious blends and some of the swag they have over at DeLunaCoffee.com. If you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, thank you. Thank you very much. Hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the YouTube page as well. Hit the bell, right, Corey? It's WarChant.com. That thing thing is flying. That Mm -hmm. thing is flying up the charts, that YouTube channel, the WarChant TV YouTube channel. Yeah, uh, Seminal Headlines was live on Tuesday. The Jeff Cameron Show resumes its uh, normal one to three slot Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, we here, uh, everything can be found over on the on the YouTube page. But WarChant.com remains your ultimate Seminal Sports Source. Corey, how you doing, man? Another day in the A. How you feeling? I'm good, buddy. How are you? You doing all right? Yeah, man. What's going on with your Bravos? They're going to mess around and make the playoffs. What's up with that? <laughs> I don't know about that. Let's slow down on that. But yeah, they've uh, the Mets kind of fell apart. Uh, and yeah, the Braves are uh, having their first little hot streak, literally of the whole season, um, and that's all it takes in that division. So we'll see, buddy. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Zero chance. I know I said this last year, and they got up three one on the Dodgers, but man, the Dodgers are just in. Uh, uh, the, nobody's beating them. The, uh, certainly not the Braves. The Braves don't have the horses. So it'd be cool if they got in the playoffs, but I'm not really sweating it because they have no chance of winning a, a championship. They, they, they got Scherzer at the at the deadline, right? The Dodgers. Yeah, and Trey Turner, who's like the probably the second best shortstop in the league. Cool. Um, and if you guys haven't seen his slide from the other night, it must have been Tuesday night. He had a he scored from second on a base hit, and his slide is the most poetic. I'm not I'm not one that, that I'm not Keats. You know what I mean? I, I don't I don't go on and on about beauty in the world. Um, but his slide, the way he touches home and slides to the end of the dirt till it makes the grass again behind home plate. And then just pops up like he was on a water slide. It's the most poetic looking slide in the history of baseball. So go, to, go check it out when you get a chance. I almost want to pause the show and go look at it myself. It's, it's crazy. It. It's incredible. It was on Twitter a lot, but it was a um, it was an impeccable slide. We're going to get back to the rest of these Renegade Express questions. Going to talk a little bit about practice observations that we had, uh, or I had, we had. We're all out there. Austin, Ira, Warchant.com got covered. Uh, but also programming note of sorts, I guess. Team is practicing starting Thursday as you're listening to this podcast out in Jacksonville. They'll be there Thursday, Friday, uh, doing two practice sessions back to Tallahassee for a scrimmage on Saturday. So we'll be out there, myself, Ira, and Austin Cox in Jacksonville. Uh, still don't know how to feel about that. I, that's the, the timing of it's a little bit curious, I feel like, Corey, just because they finally on Wednesday went to full squad practice. They didn't do the, the two-a-day where, you know, they broke everything up. It's Everybody's out there one sort of practice. You felt like maybe this is getting a little bit of a lather, but they're going to they're gonna kind of shake it up, but... Norvell mentioned uh, after practice, you know, hey, there's times where he's been with a football team and a fire alarm's gone off at a team hotel, but you still got to wake up the next day and go play football. So I guess trying to make them comfortable being uncomfortable maybe is a little bit of a, a secondary part of this thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I you know, I, I don't quite, under, I guess his point with, I don't quite understand your trepidation with it, although I'm not having to go to Jacksonville. You're, as people listen to this, you're in Jacksonville. So I get it. Um but yeah, it's just I think they're trying to treat it like a road game, right? Like he mentioned it on Wednesday when he's asked about it. Like you know, you you make them a little uncomfortable. You're sleeping in another bed. You're doing something that you, you know you don't get to control everything. We're not on our campus, and five of the games they play this year will not be on their campus. And you know the NFL teams all do it still, even though they're multi-billion-dollar franchises. So you know it is what it is. Yeah, 
I mean, I'm not that. I don't have trepidation. Is actually, I bet yeah, trepidation. That's an accurate word. Yeah, I, I mean, whatever. I don't get it, but hey, I'll be there and let's see how it goes. Um, it's Jack. I mean, it'd be nice if there was like a ancillary benefit, maybe recruiting wise. But Jacksonville isn't the most talent rich part of the state, at least this cycle. I don't feel like. Um, but hey. You know, he's the coach. He knows what his team needs. They need a two-day trip to Jacksonville, and we shall be there. Well, right. it was supposed to be a three-day, remember? I think the plan was for them to scrimmage there on Saturday as well. Initially, I think that was the plan. And then, obviously, you know, Bobby Bowden's memorial service is Saturday morning, so it would you, you, the team doesn't need to be in Jacksonville away from Tallahassee when that happens. And certainly the coaches don't. So um, I think they pivoted on that, and now the scrimmage, that's why – the scrimmage is uh, later in the day at Doak. All right, so they practiced Wednesday, was able to kind of watch a little bit more, pay a little bit more attention. Your DBs, Corey, did not rise to the occasion, I don't feel like, at least in one-on-ones. It was, okay. I'd say it was probably All like right. 70-30. It wasn't a bad day for them. I think it was more of a good day for the receivers than it was a bad day for the defensive backs because a lot of these notes I'm looking at, these were, a lot of these catches were made in traffic, tight coverage, so... Uh, Malik McLean had two that, that made the notebook because they were that nice. Uh, Darren Robinson had a nice catch. Williamson. Williamson. What I say? Okay, Darren? good. You said Robinson. Sorry. Thank you, Corey. That's all right, buddy. Jordan Young, I guess apparently all he does is make sliding catches. Had another sliding catch. Okay. Uh, but, again, he's I, – So I you're saying the rec- you, would, you would guesstimate that the receivers caught about 70%? Of the, of the I plays say, of one on one, how about six? They they got the better of it on sixty percent. Now they, some there was a guy that dropped two wide open passes, beat his guy. So uh, do you really give credit to him? Uh, but I'm not going to give credit to the defensive back because they got beat. Right, uh, right. But, I mean, I think if you if you if you saw that two or three periods they ran of one on ones receivers versus defensive backs, you'd be like, all right, man, these receivers can get open. They they know they, they got some wiggle. They can figure it out. Uh, your guy Kevin Knowles though was one of the uh, defensive backs that was good in coverage. Uh, one of the guys had to, had to jot down mm-hmm. as, as mm-hmm. winning his matchups. As okay. well as Hunter Washington. Hunter Washington also had a good uh, show out. And Shaheen Brown as well, too. Shaheen Brown's a guy, very undervalued, under-recruited prospect out of Lake City High School, uh, or Columbia High School in Lake City, I think is, it is. I apologize. Uh, and he was a guy that drew attention and a compliment from Norville earlier on in camp, so... It's good to see a, a young guy kind of rising to the occasion out there. Again, him, Kevin Knowles, uh, doing quite well. 11 well it's also 11. good, But it's also oh. good that the receivers um, have stepped it up a little bit. I'm telling you, dude, yeah, in that man. first yeah. practice, well, I believe it, it was a 0%. Like, literally, I think they didn't complete a pass in one-on-ones. It was like maybe one or two. Maybe. But it, And I don't even – they were not memorable. They just – they didn't do anything. They, they It was like nine straight incompletions. And then Sunday wasn't much better, at least with the the ones in the uh, and I'm talking about the, the 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 first practices with the veterans. It was all DBs, and then slowly the third practice, the receivers made a few more plays, and now it sounds like they kind of got the better of them, which is good. They're raising their level, which is what you have to do. Yeah, Pokey also had a touchdown catch, deep ball that was thrown off the arm of Tate Rodemaker. So, okay, um, I see a Tate. Everybody's getting involved in there. Yeah, Milton Milton had a real nice back shoulder throw. To to McLean, that was the one that, that was the first one that was like, wow, okay, they they came to play today, so uh, was definitely good to see. They spent obviously a good amount of time on on special teams doing gunners gunner work. Uh, let me go back and look at my list here, make sure I'm good on that one. Malik McLean's another guy that he got. I put two check marks next to their name if Mike Norvell shouted them out and was like, good job, Malik, got a boy, because. They do this other drill, Corey, where there was either three or four offensive linemen going up against two defensive linemen. So yeah. one guy yeah. was always double teamed, and then the other guy was had a single. single yeah, it was man the matchup. center. It would be it would be the center guard and tackle against the tackle and defensive end of the of the defense. Yeah, and, and it, it, would, it would rotate. It would go to the right. It'd go to the left. It'd go to the right. 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 And the frustrating thing, though, is. You know, we're not exactly sure who's supposed to get the double team and, and, and what guy, even if he does get single, is he supposed to, you know, stunt and stem off of uh, what's happening in front of him. So, And then the thing is, no one's celebrating. Like, all the coaches are just yelling. Like, nobody's happy. Like, Norvell's yelling at the, at the offensive line. Papooch is yelling at his defensive lineman. Odell's yelling at his defensive lineman. Atkins is going and instructing his offensive lineman. There's no attaboys in this, so it's really tough to judge it. So I, I'll, I'll kind of gloss over that one. 
Uh, I did see some good stuff. Uh, I wrote down some names. Jarrett Jackson's a guy that, that flashed a little bit out there, and, and Norvell said physically he's a guy that's ready to contribute. It's just whether he can consistently put it together, but they're, they're depending on him. They, like, they want to depend on this guy. It's, just, it's up to him if he can um, meet their expectations. Uh, a guy, Rob Scott, had a good win over Keir Thomas. Um, Dennis Briggs had a good win over uh, Dante Lucas. That's okay. these are ones that, like I could you could definitely tell, and then Jermaine Johnson doing Jer- Jermaine Johnson things and decleating an offensive lineman. So that was oh, super cool. To nice. See. Okay, yeah. I like I like this Aslan. You're out there giving the observations this time. I like it. You got the but you have the binoculars. Absolutely. Out? Yes, Absolutely. sir. Yes, sir, my man. Good job, buddy. And the thing is, I'm actually learning how to use them now. I used to just put them up to my face. And I'm like, okay. But now I'm like dialing it in and getting focused. Oh, okay. And even, you're even... aiming it at the right thing you're looking well, at? Okay. I think well, that's I apparently, a weird thing to say. I think I apparently have the ability to zoom in even more. I thought like you just put binoculars up to your face and it is what it is. Like that's what you're going to be able to see. But I'm able to dial it in and go even further in. And I, I, can, I can almost like read – if I could read lips – I'm close enough to where I could see. Okay. Like, you know, Powerful binoculars. Did yeah, you man. get those from the ACC network? No, man. Those These are... aren't the glow in the dark. These aren't uh, the night vision binoculars. Uh, oh, no, yeah. No, they're not Bell and Howell. They're, they're not Bell and Howells. <laughs> uh, all right. Mako Dotson got a shout out by the coach and special teams. Those are just two gunners, two uh, coverage guys, or two guys setting up for a return. Travis J got an attaboy from uh, Mike Norvell and uh, DJ Williams, Amari Gaynor, and Kentron Portier. Portier put a dude on his back with one arm just like just totally okay. shook him uh so those are the guys that did well field goals Grothaus hit one from 32 Fitzgerald hit one from 37 that's all I saw on the field goal end of things and I wasn't able to see a lot of the 11 on 11 towards the end of practice because I ended up you know putting up the video which I need to just be like don't just focus on watching practice Ira mentioned that he thought Jordan Travis looked pretty sharp uh, by the time I got down there, I only saw three uh, reps, and they were all from Mackenzie Milton. One was a sweet little sc- screen pass to Corey Wren where he drops back, he looks right, everything kind of flows over to the right, but then he just does a little dipsy do, like, you know, spins and throws to his left, and Corey Wren had all sorts of daylight and used his speed and, and got open and, and was a big, big gainer. Uh, okay. Otherwise, ah, I should have wrote down there um, – I don't know who 14 is. I should look that up. But I know Derek McClendon was all was disruptive for the defense in that in that small 14 portion. 14 is of, the uh, is the is it Cushney? Is it Cushney? Yeah, Cushney. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. Uh, so they made the notebook. They made my notebook. Nice. Okay. Um, good. So yeah, that's what that's what I saw, Corey. Those are those are my observations. I can't wait for you to get back out there so you can observe because I mean uh, that was just a flood of information. Too. I, I didn't even sorry. know it was coming. I'm I didn't even know it was coming. It just it, it was a, it just a gusher. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't like diarrhea of the mouth, was it? Like it was you could follow along to a certain degree. I hope. No, no, I got you. I just didn't know it was coming. It was it was good information, man. You're you're look, man. We're out there. We get to go out there. It would be a disservice to the people listening to this show. They're clearly Florida State football fans. You would hope. Unless they're just fans of, like, you or I, our voices. Mm. Um, so they're, this is information they want. This is information they want, and you're giving it to them. So, yeah, that was good stuff. The, the video I post, I feel like, Corey, you should, if anything, you should just go read, since I read all your columns, you should just read the comments whenever I post practice footage because there's so much uh, negative vibes. No one's feeling mm. good. And well, I, it's the and Internet. I, I know, but I try to remind them, like, hey, this is 15 minutes, the first 15 yes. minutes, mind Correct. you, of right. a two-hour-long practice. And the end of the 11-on-11 is what Ira was uh, referring to when he said that he thought Jordan Travis looked quite quite crisp out there performing and executing. Now, these first 11-on-11s that you're seeing in the video, everybody, I mean, it's it's 9.13 a.m. You know, they've only been out there for 20 minutes stretching and warming up, so I wouldn't put – all that much stock into it. But I wonder how much of it, Corey, to place pop psychologist. Again, I don't, I don't mean to make you put your stethoscope on two times in a week, especially back to back. Right. I think most of the people that are even gnashing their teeth over what they're seeing on this video realize that, you know, a six, seven win season is probably what's in store for Florida State. So is it is it are we in the preseason mode where we still believe because we're Florida State fans, it's Florida State, it's the iconic brand, you still believe no matter what in your heart of hearts that they're gonna be really good somehow. They're gonna surprise you. Uh that you kind of block out what a sick the reality of what this team is, or do we just not realize that hey, they look inconsistent, the offensive line's struggling at times, 
That's what a six and seven team looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more to that. It's just people, you know, the uh, unrealistic expectations, I guess. Because yeah, when you're looking at, uh, you know, nobody that listens to this show, I would hope, would think that we we think there's a special season coming. Um, we think there can be a special season a year or two from now, maybe. Yeah. But right now, this is a stopgap. This is a this is a building block. This is all this season could be. And I feel like if you go into the season thinking, okay, I'm expecting six wins. Anything more than that, I'll be pleasantly surprised. Anything less than that, I'll be, I'll be unpleasantly disappointed. But I won't be irate or excited, like, you know, either way. That's kind of how I live my life, though, on an even keel. Hmm. Some people live their lives uh, a quarter mile at a time. Right. I live my life on an even keel. Oh, but okay. so it's odd to me. Yeah, it's kind of odd for people to be uh, wringing their hands about what they see in practice footage from a team that was three and six a season ago. You know what I mean? Nobody thinks this. This is like if you thought Florida State was a top ten team. If you thought they, if you were like a Georgia fan and you're like, we're, "This is good. this is the year." Finally, I know it's been forty one years, but this is it. I promise. And you see some footage where you're not really excited about. I could understand the hand wringing then, like, "Oh, this isn't going to get it done against Alabama." But it's it's a team that's in a rebuilding mode, and they're coming off a three and six season. So it feels like the lenses in your eyes should be adjusted accordingly to how you view that. But you know. That's it's people on the internet, man, and it's fans. Yeah. They're fanatical. Most importantly, irrational, even irrational sometimes. Yeah. Most importantly, though, head coach Mike Norvell did not seem down or disappointed. He'd be said this is part of the, laying down the fundamentals. This is the way they've broke things up. The three, I think he said they they looked at it in terms of breaking it up into like four uh, four practices, almost like per session. So they had those three split squads they had today. Then they're going to go to Jacksonville, get two in, get that scrimmage in. So like the way he's dividing it up, like they're they're progressing along the way they want to. And defense won the day, in his opinion. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the fact that Norvell single uh, singled out Quayshon Fuller as being a guy that's put together a really good first four camp, uh, first first four days. I'm sorry of camp. So yeah. they, hey man, you need these people that you're not expecting possibly to, to kind of rise to the occasion. Like that that's the thing too, Corey. So. Are, are people more of the belief or the hope that the guys that we're talking about are going to perform up to the level they were either recruited at or how they performed at their previous institutions? Or do you want to be in a place where, like, are we going to be surprised? Like, if this team does win six or seven games, is it going to be because Jermaine Johnson and player that transferred for Jamie Robinson play really well? Or is it going to be because three or four of these guys that we're not talking about have kind of surprised us and come out of nowhere? Like a Quayshon Fuller, maybe giving you that quality depth at, at the you know second spot of your defensive end. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think for them to get to seven wins, it's going to be on the backs of the transfers. Um, you know, and that, that I'm including in the transfers like Jordan Wilson and Jordan Travis yeah. and people like that. People, uh, uh, Jashawn Corbin, not just the ones that came uh, this past year, but the ones that uh, Devonte Love Taylor, people like that. Uh, but yeah, no, I you know it'll be. You hope it's a healthy combination of both. Because some of those guys are bouncing after a year. They're, they're, this is their last year in college. So whether, whether it's Parchment or, you know, Darian Williamson, you know, you're, 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 I guess you'd rather, if you're going to say, which one do you want to have a breakout year? Probably the Williamson kid because he's just a, a freshman. But, yeah, you know, I think, it, honestly, realistically, it's going to be a combination of both. And like I've said, I think, I think more than half or probably half, maybe a little bit more half of the starting 22 will be transfers. That's crazy. That's unheard of. Unprecedented here at Florida State. So that 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 you have to adjust the way you you view this team in that in that regard too. But yeah, man, you, you know some of these guys will have to make steps because otherwise, like you, you like you're saying, okay, great. Jermaine Johnson has 12 sacks in his first team All ACC. Well, he's gone now. So what what do we look? What do you look forward to for 2022? Well, what if Fuller has seven and a half sacks and really shows that he could be the next guy? That's something to look forward to, right? So that's that, that's how you that's how you view the season, I would think. Let's keep it on the transfer sort of thing before we uh, pivot to Renegade Express. Corey, you listened to the interviews and, and wrote about uh, the South Carolina duo, Keir Thomas mm. and Jamie Robinson. Uh, what are they bringing? You think to practice right now, and uh, how excited are they to be in Tallahassee? And how excited does it seem that Mike Norvell is to, to have those two guys in the fold? I think well, I think Jamie Robinson particularly because he's been here in the spring too. He's a guy that's just. He's one of those energy dudes, right? He's a brings he's good. Juice. He he knows it. Yeah, Kier Thomas said he brings the juice. They call uh, him Jack Lalane. I think they call him Jack Lalane in the locker room. 
Jamie Robinson. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a reference that I'm sure all that locker room gets. And uh, uh, so, but like Kier Thomas said that he he's like Keyshawn Helton came up to him and uh, told him, "Man, I need to go up against Jamie every day. He makes me better." Um, and that's cool, man. That's that's the leadership that you're looking for. It's also the challenging, the competitiveness spirit that, com- that that you're looking for. And this is a kid that started two years in the SEC. He started in the SEC as a true freshman and was all SEC first team. He's got like 140 tackles in his career in two seasons. Keir Thomas has like 200 tackles in his career and whatever, 18 and a half tackles for loss. He's played in 40-something games. So these guys bring in... Um, not only production on the field, but the leadership. And Keir Thomas, I thought was funny talking about. Man, did you hear that? Yeah, was that thunder? Were you, are you on the? Yeah, are you on the back thunder. porch or something? Good no, gosh. I'm in my house. That was crazy. That was loud. Wow. It even looks like it's partly cloudy outside. That was a that was a thunder clap. Um, that was like a thunder strus, ACDC type thunder. Thunder. But uh, so yeah, Kier Thomas talking about like you know how people get in college and they they might think they're too cool to ask for help <laughs> yeah, from a teammate. Yeah, I like that. But he's like, I'm here for him and I'm trying to be a coach because he, I mean, he is. He's got more experience by far than any other defensive lineman on that roster. So uh, I mean, by far, 47 games or 45 games or whatever it's been for him is a ton of football that he's played. So uh, so yeah, I, I think you're getting leadership from those guys too. I don't. That's not as important as the production. The production is the most important, but that leadership can't be. Uh, I don't think it should be undervalued either. I think that does matter. Yeah, anecdotally, in that same sort of vein, Jermaine Johnson. I saw him between reps coaching up George Wilson, uh, one of the defensive ends that they recruited here this past season. Just you know, I mean, he's getting instruction when he's doing his actual rep, and then in between work, he's got a guy like Jermaine Johnson reaching out to him and you know placing his hands on him, showing where you got to be. So yeah. these guys are embracing the fact that, hey, I mean, they're here to get their, you know, uh, their opportunity to get the reps they want to get to put together the tape they want to get to to get where they want to get. But sure. they're also being mindful of the fact that they they got to leave this place better than they found it. So that's super cool because, I mean, they don't have an obligation to do that, but they're embracing that. I guess that goes back to the whole family and fit thing. So uh, that was super cool to see. Okay, good. Hey, before we get into Renegade Express, I wanted to uh, just opine for a second. Did you see the Baylor stuff that came down on Wednesday? Hey, we're not a national show. We're, we're just Florida State. Central. No, no, but it, I, I'm 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 going to make it national. I'm re- going to make it specific to Florida State. Can I so, can, can I just read the tweet real quick here that I saw from Bruce Feldman that I, I read out loud to uh, Ira? Um, sure. I can't. I can't find. So I just totally screwed it all up. So you go. Oh, ahead, Aslan. I was scrolling. I thought it'd be like right there in front of my face, but I'm following too many people apparently now, or they're just tweeting a bunch of nonsense. Well, just search Bruce me. Feldman. Okay. Well, don't tell me how to live my life, Corey. Gosh, man. <laughs> Sorry, not, my fault. Not, not my Brady, fault. man. I'm my own. My own man. <laughs> um, right. I mean, it should be right there. But I, I, so, how about this? Max Olson tweeted this out. So the committee of infractions on Art Briles. An incurious attitude towards potential criminal conduct was deeply troubling. He failed to meet even the most basic expectations of how a person should react to the kind of conduct at issue. Technically, this is not an NCAA violation, though. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the one I had was that in, in, the, in the ruling from the panel, uh, by the way, so the NCAA, after five years investigating and put investigating in big, big, big quote marks, <laughs> but five years investigating the Baylor nonsense, the Baylor debacle, uh, this is what they ruled. Baylor admitted to moral and ethical failings in its handling of sexual and interpersonal violence on campus, but argued those failings, however egregious, did not constitute violations of NCA rules. Ultimately, and with tremendous reluctance, uh-huh. this panel agrees. <laughs> okay, so my point being to swing it back to Florida State. By Bounds, the all-time wins coach in college football history. That's right. In our mind, in your mind, in reality, because we saw the games happen. He got stripped of wins because of a tutor in a music class. He got stripped of, I can't even remember the number now, 16 wins, 15 wins, something ridiculous. So he's now second. What Florida State needs to do, because the NCAA is worthless, literally worthless. It's pointless and worthless, and it will cease to exist probably in the next three to four years anyway. Um, It's trying to, it seems like it's almost trying to dissolve. But so North Carolina suffered no consequences for creating a whole fake major just to just to pass athletes and keep them eligible. And then Baylor suffers no consequences at all for the most renegade of renegade things that has ever probably happened on a college campus, um, or at least in the top 10. But Bobby Bowden isn't the all time winningest coach because of a 
tutor in a music class. I think it was music. I might be wrong. It was. It was. Were, and it, it was, was twelve. Music, right? And it was twelve. Uh, Wednesday vacated. So I don't care what the NCA says. I don't care what they threaten for punishment. Florida State needs to, on its banner, honoring Bobby Bowden, say NCAA all-time wins leader. They need to restore the wins. Screw the NCAA. If the NCAA doesn't recognize it, well, I don't recognize the NCAA. It is a pointless, worthless organization. It is a jo- it's a fraud, basically, and has been rendered that for years. So they want to go vacate these wins. No, say no, you're not doing it. We're putting our wins back up. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, NCAA? Are you going to are you going to strip us of scholarships because we put in our banner that Florida State that Bobby Bowden is the all time wins coach? You're going to do that. You're going to punish Florida State, but you won't punish Baylor for fault. So in, in the coach just ignoring it. So you call their bluff. What is the NCAA going to do? I can tell you what they're going to do. Jack squat. So just give Bobby his wins back. Give Bobby his wins back. The NCAA has no teeth anymore. They don't even want to be a part. Or maybe they'll investigate it for 12 years. Put the wins back. Say, Recognize him as the all-time wins coach. Paint it all over your stadium. And make sure people know that he's the all-time, wins, all-time winningest coach in FBS history. Are you with me, Aslan? Absolutely. But the problem, okay. though, is, and I, I should know this stuff. File this under things Aslan should know but doesn't know. And he hosts the Florida State podcast. Doesn't Paterno still have more even if you give him the 12 back? Oh, well, then, hey, everyone, forget what I just said. I'd still give Bowden his wins back. It's yeah. crazy. Well, because well, I'm reading it here. So they were going to make – they they had him vacate 111 wins. Who, Penn Paterno? State. Yes. They well, vacated, that's, that was ridiculous. They too, vacated all ahead. of Penn State's wins from 98 to 2011 as part of the punishment. Then in 2015 <laughs> – Legal settlement. The NCAA reversed their decision, restored all of their uh, all the 111 wins to Paterno. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, and we all kind of remember what happened at Penn State, right? We I caught. Don't. We kind of all remember. It was a little a little dicey out there. It was a pretty pretty rough um, accusations and proven crimes, and they restored his wins. Hmm. But heaven forbid that music tutor. He, you know, I, I just think this is this is. But again, if it even if it doesn't get him to Paterno, which maybe it doesn't, maybe he he would also need what he did at his first school, like South Georgia or something. Like he didn't get credit for those either. Um, and if he got credit for those, he'd be the all time winningest coach. But give him to him, man. Yeah. Just recognize him. Who cares what the NCAA recognizes or doesn't recognize? Florida State should recognize recognize the three or four seasons Bowden coached at South Georgia. Add those to his win total, as well as the 12 that he got stripped because of a music tutor. And say, you know what? Prove us wrong, NCAA. Do something. Because you don't do anything. No, no, no. Yeah, do something. Uh, man, Paterno was there from 66 to 2011. My yeah. God. That's crazy, right? Find a hobby, man. You know, gosh. That was a long time to be there. Well, I mean, Bowden was, well, Bowden was 76 to 09. Yeah. But, yeah, that's that pales in comparison, right? That's like two decades less, right? Yeah. Or a decade and a half less. Flesh out the wins per year. Bobby's got them. Bobby's got them. So, gosh, we just would have won. The, who, was it this Mesa that missed the freaking extra point in the freaking Orange Bowl in 05, 2006? <sighs> yes. Yes. Freaking weird. I don't remember who missed it, but I do remember that it was the a weed. short field goal. I don't know it if it was an extra goal. point. Um, <sighs> but, yeah, they both. Penn State's guy missed one, and then he missed one, and, and on they went. Whatever, we got the Blockbuster Bowl. That's all. That's the real head That's right, man. 1990. 1990. All right, let's get to it then. It's uh, time for Renegade Express. These questions all come from our value subscribers at Warchant.com. It's the ultimate symbol sports source. Promo code Warchant30 for 30 free days of access. Get it now. It'll take you through the Notre Dame game, and you, you can tell everybody that you weren't a fan later. You know, like once they beat Notre Dame, everybody's going to want to get back on this thing, and you'll be like, hey, I was here. I got my badge to prove it. All right, we uh, left off with uh, our guy James B. in Pensacola. We resume with Will Noll D. 56. Wake up! I started bringing my children to Doke as soon as they were potty trained, easing into things with the Taggart spring game and then a few others that thankfully they'll be too young to remember. But come this fateful Sunday in September, my kids and wife will get to experience what no doubt will be an unforgettable night. So my question is, what is the first unforgettable moment either of you had at Doke? Man. Yeah, 
Pessy, hmm. you're gonna win on that one. I I mean, gosh, my first the first game I ever saw in Doak was the first ACC home loss. The two thousand one against Phil Rivers, right? That was the first time they lost at home versus an ACC team. Oh yeah, might have been. Yeah. yeah it would've it would have had to have been, yeah. Yeah. Um Man, I'm trying to think. 83, I don't think I – it's a little before you, before that. I don't think I went to a game in 83. So, 84, um, losing to Auburn, 42-41. That's, that was – I mean, it's not a great well, one. Well, he wants a good one. He wants the unforgettable one. Well, um, that was unforgettable. It was a crazy game. I guess I would say – That was forgettable. Ooh. 2002, I guess, do that beating Florida. Anytime you beat Florida or your rival, it's I think it's always unforgettable. Unless I don't know, 2011 Florida was gross. Jimbo, figure out a way to you know do better. Um, but yeah, the 2002 Florida game. I know that the stakes weren't all that high, but with all the tumult that was going on with Ricks and Adrian McPherson and this Ron Zook guy being a jerk and thinking that he's you know Newt Rockney meshed with Pete mm. Carroll. Right, uh, and then Leon Washington just running crazy because man, they were down to Leon was like I don't know fourth string running back because they had Greg Jones he, he got hurt in Wake Forest I don't think Nick Maddox was healthy for that game, uh, and Leon went nuts on him that felt really good because I was very I was very anxious about that game I'm like I don't want to lose to Florida we don't lose to Florida in this place so that was an unforgettable that's pretty probably the first real big win I saw at Doak was that one and then, you know pales in comparison to whatever Corey's about to lay out but such is life go ahead Corey. One up me, two up me. No, I was. I guess I'm going to go back to '89 uh, because I didn't see a lot of great wins. At, but most of the games I went to actually were on the road back then when I was when I was a kid growing up. So '89, they played Auburn and Miami back to back. Both were in the top ten, and Florida State had started that season with two losses, including to Brett Favre mm. in the uh, in the opener. And so they beat Auburn uh, on a Saturday night, and that's back when Saturday nights were big at Doak. That's when all the big games were played at night. Um, Beat them uh, 22-14, maybe. They beat them by eight. And then um, and then the very next week, Miami, who ended up winning the national championship, came to Florida State. And that's probably, that's in my top three of all-time memorable games at Doak. It was just so loud. Uh, Leroy Butler intercepts the first pass of the game. Dexter Carter then scores on the next play on a 30-something, 37-yard run, I want to say. And then it was just uh, it was just a great defensive struggle after that. And our man Kirk Carruthers had an incredible game, um, and yeah, so that it was just so loud and so energetic. I was fourteen. Um, yeah, that that's probably my first most unforgettable moment. What was the score of that Auburn game? You said I said twenty-two to fourteen. I don't know if you're I right. You're right, Corey. Eight. You're right. Oh, you're right. Sweet. You're right. And Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Ten was FSU Miami the next week, right? Correct. What was Auburn ranked? Does it say eleventh? Oh, okay. What about Miami? Two. Oh, yeah, man. They left. Now, they did have to play Toretta, and I say that because Toretta was their backup. Craig Erickson had gotten hurt, and he threw a bunch of picks. But still, a win's a win, man. Dub's a dub. Uh, and that was a great, great moment. How long was Dexter Carter's run to open the game? I don't have that in front of me. Come on, man. Just oh, one, man. Man, on Wiki, just bad. looking at the – I'm not on Noel fan. Sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe we should – you know, like ESPN has that relationship with the Elias Sports Bureau, or they used to. We should just have, like, Noel fan as our – data and historical reference i need to figure out how to navigate it quicker i'm just always easier for me to be like fsu wikipedia 1989 boom i'll, I'll get well, better yeah i'll get yeah, better you'll get, yeah sure i'll get better all right tennis ump so love the direction that warchan is going and gene should be proud of the moves that he has made by the way it was his birthday yesterday so if you haven't wish happy birthday to the godfather Go wish him happy birthday, everybody. I should. I didn't even do that. What's the matter with me? How many of the transfers do you guys expect to start this year, game one? Thanks. Yeah, I just want to make my dyslexia didn't come in there. and I was asking if how many are going to start one game. But no, he says, how many transfers do you expect to start this year, game one? Okay, we can go down the easy. I wonder if he's just talking about from this past season, like transfers that just transferred in. Um, I'm, I'm there all. I mean, um, I, I get what everyone's saying. The guys at Norvell may be brought in, but uh, I'll we'll, we'll put Jordan Travis in the in the in the pile. We can I'm play. not saying I expect him, but he's certainly in the running uh, as is Corbin. Uh, you know, Parchment, Devontae Love, Taylor, mm-hmm. uh, Keir Thomas, Jermaine Johnson, Six, Jamie Robinson, seven. Dylan um, Gibbons. Yeah, probably Dylan Gibbons. Eight. Um, 
who else are we looking at? Who else? I don't think the Brandon Moore kid will start. The the corner from UCF. I think he'll play, but I don't think he'll start. Um, Jordan Wilson. You think they'll come out maybe two tight? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know if you call him a starter, but he's going to get starter reps. I think he'll play a lot. Um, and then the DB, uh, the McClellan kid, probably not right. Hey, I don't think he'll start the first game. You know, game yeah. one. Like, who's starting against Notre Dame? I wouldn't think he's – I mean, he might be in the mix, but I don't – you know, I don't – that's the thing. I don't even know right now, Corey. I mean, whoever yeah. asked us the question yesterday, like, all right, you keep talking about the defensive backs looking good. Like, well, then name some names. I can't even tell you right now who I think – who's first team defense. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm technically even allowed to tell you. You folks. wouldn't be allowed to, but, yeah, yeah. I can't either. I, I think Knowles is going to play. I think Brownlee is a guy they like. Um, and then the the safety position, you know, they're, they're, they've got some options. So – um yeah it's it'll be it'll be a healthy portion uh in either way whatever whether it's milton or travis it's a transfer one of those guys is yeah, starting there's nine so so yeah it's in there's probably going to be one or two more i would think i think corbin probably starts and toa Feely is the uh the change up back so yeah you're looking at least 10 i think yeah man first game look at that nearly half of your roster churned flipped what a luxury all right, last and one. For all we know, the uh, other kid might be the the other defensive end, the kid that just transferred in. Marcus, he's Cushney. explosive. Yeah, yeah now he's Cushney. he's undersized. He's not a big kid. He's not going to impress you with his physical stature. Um, but he gets off the ball, man. He's quick. Yeah, you know for sure. He it, it's deceptive. It, it definitely is deceptive. Um, the, the way he kind of uh, his physical talent. I just looked it up, by the way. So Bowden went twenty-two and eleven at South Georgia College State, where he also served as the AD and the baseball coach. I didn't realize that. Good old days. Um, so he went twenty-two and eleven. So that's twenty-two wins. And then you give him the twelve back that he needs that he lost that he earned that we all saw that yes. exist in real life. So that gives him thirty-four extra wins that puts him at four hundred and eleven. Joe Paterno has four hundred and nine. Okay. So I don't care what the NCAA says or recognizes. Florida State, why Florida State can say, yeah, we do recognize those South Georgia wins. They were wins. That's a college football team that he coached that won 22 games and started his career. So we're recognizing those wins, and we're also recognizing the 12 from the music tutor, and now he has 411 wins, and he's the all-time winning his coach, and you're not going to do squat about it. Okay. I like it. There you go. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm saying. All right, last one comes from our guy, Leroy. Leroy, possibly. Get down black. Wake up. Morning, Ashman and Sea Dog. Mm. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't sign up for that one. Come on. <laughs> Ashman. I was just wondering what you guys think. Well, you came to the right place. I remember <laughs> reading somewhere that the offense was only running 10% of the playbook. That's why they were pretty good on the first few scripted plays and drives. How good do you think the offense could really be knowing the whole playbook and a full offseason to practice unlike the COVID year? I don't I don't I don't know about the 10 percent play. I think 10 percent is way low. I, I don't think they were close to utilizing the whole thing. And it was, you know, we can blame it all we want. But Jordan Travis, the two got their two best quarterbacks last year could barely practice the whole season. Jordan Travis missed most of the preseason. Chubba missed most of the preseason. So what, once Jordan Travis is your starting quarterback and he's practiced about four days, he's played more games than he's practiced. So how, how, much, of the, how much can you expand, really? You know what I mean? You've got you've to simplify it because the guy just didn't get the reps that he needed to get. He didn't have a spring at all. And then his August was cut short. You wanted to try to throw it all at him in August, but he was cut short because he was hurt. So I, I don't... I, I think if they if they kept the offense, uh, you know, 30, 40 percent of the playbook, it was mainly because of the person calling the plays in the huddle. Well, they don't huddle. You know what I mean? Right. At the line of scrimmage. Hadn't gotten a lot of reps with any of it. And so now Jordan Travis has played a full year. He's also had a full spring. McKenzie Mil Milton has had a full spring. I would think it's, you know, I don't know if you can put a number on it, but they've at least doubled or tripled um what they knew from a season ago right or what they could install yeah, yeah. what they what they could really work on and rep yeah i mean kenny mentioned he, he used the metaphor of learning a language and it, it was 
teaching them words. Now it's like grammar, right? It's you know learning what a past participle is and subject mm. verb agreement, all that kind right. of stuff. So they're right. they're moving up levels. Hate to kind of bury this, but when I when I interviewed him at the media luncheon, there was this tweet I saw from one of my guys back in Austin. Uh, that Steve Sarkeesian, they were asking him how many reps should one of his running backs get, and he was saying, you know, a lot of it will depend on, you know, flow of the game, obviously, but as a running back, sometimes you need to be able to stand there a little bit longer to, to find your rhythm because there's stuff that you haven't seen before on tape, and as a running back, you have to get used to that. So I asked Kenny, I'm like, is that really, like, how how surprised are you guys within the course of a game on a Saturday? Because I feel like we, you know, fans, media, we like to think that there's this huge fluctuation week to week of what they're doing. But I think the more I watch, the more I'm around, the more you talk to these guys, they really they just do what they do, and they just try to do it as well as they can. And he mentioned that, you know, it's different in the SEC because everything is so much as – there are so many Sabanites. You've got, you know, what Kirby's doing. You had what Muschamp was doing in South Carolina for a certain amount of time. You had – a little bit of the flavor in, in Florida with, with uh, Jeff Collins when he was there. Um, although I don't know if Jeff Collins – he's got a thing, a little cross-pollination with, with Saban. But he was talking about in the ACC, it's a grab bag. Like, he's like, you just – there's – everything is – you're seeing so many different things. He did mention that when you play a team like Duke, they're really just primarily zoned because they don't have enough athletes to keep up with you. But what he right. was saying is that you'll see it mostly second – like mid-second quarter going into halftime is when things – might start going a little bit sideways because at that point you've made your adjustments. At that point, whatever you know, they 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 kind of start stemming off what their conventional base stuff is and try to throw some more stuff at you. And then obviously they start um, adapting and and putting in changes to what they see. So maybe that's part of it too uh, of why they're so successful in that first uh, drive of the first half and the second half because they've just they've hammered it and they. The defense can know what's coming at them, but they've hammered that so well and so crisp that they can just execute in their sleep. Now it's a matter of when the other side starts figuring things out, can you adapt a little bit better than you did last season? So, Hey, amen, buddy. Amen, well, no, man. brother. I mean, golly, it's August 12th as you guys are listening to this. What is that, like 22 days? I don't know. That was terrible. Don't even quote me on that. My math is horrible. But you know what I'm saying. We're almost there, Corey. Mm, Football's we're getting, getting there. We've got a scrimmage. Got a scrimmage in, what, two days? Yeah, man. Right. Yeah. Well, so we'll uh, have a reaction from that. But first, again, they'll be in Jacksonville Thursday and Friday. We will be out there full coverage, interviews, practice footage. Uh, we'll be on site for you folks. That's what we do. Don't forget, Jeff Cameron Show, 1 to 3 p.m. live on YouTube TV, or War Chant TV on YouTube, rather. Also, 93.3 Terrestrial Radio in Tallahassee. Thanks for listening to Wake Up War Chant. We'll be back with another program for you folks on Friday. He is Corey Clark. I'm Aslan Hajavandi. Thank you so much for listening to Wake Up War Chant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-Cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemmix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.